Yeah, what's going on Instagram? My name is Master Sergeant Garen, Special Operations Recruiter. Uh, I got Tech Sergeant Mo Mooney. He's a SEER specialist. He's an instructor down here at Lackland Air Force Base. If you're interested in SEER, this is one of your career choices in the Air Force. You're probably going to see this guy. Uh, what we're going to do is we're probably going to go through about 45 minutes to an hour of uh, just general questions and answers. Sergeant Mooney here is going to tell you a little bit about himself, what he's done in the Air Force so far, what you can expect as far as a SEER specialist goes, training, nutrition, day-to-day -day operations, you name it. we got a ton of questions that you guys have already submitted already, and then we'll be sure to answer your questions as you, as you post them up above. Um, before we get started, uh, I know a lot of people out there, uh, they already made comments and everything like that to say, hey, look, SEER is a special operations. Look, we're special operations recruiters. We recruit for Battlefield Airmen, special operations, special tactics, combat support, you name it. That duty title is simply too large to put on a business card, okay? So we summed it up and said special operations recruiting. So we recruit for these guys, we recruit for EOD, we recruit for ALO, you name it. That's what we do right here. And this is one of the lucky guys we got on our team ready to talk. So if anybody's out there commenting or saying something about that, guys, first, educate yourself about what we do, okay? Second, if there's any negative comments that are out there, we don't need that. Take your keyboard, go troll somewhere else, okay? We're here positive to educate what you guys are doing. We have great volunteers that are out there crushing the mission daily like this guy right here. So listen to what he has to say. Again, post your questions up there. At the end of this, if we don't get to your questions, DM us, we'll be happy to answer as time goes by. I'm also gonna do my best, if I can remember this, to post this up on our YouTube page. That's USAF Special Operations Recruiting on YouTube. So make sure you smash that subscribe button. So without further ado, Tech Star Mooney. Yep, thanks for the intro. Uh, thanks for the opportunity as well. And the, uh, the more chances we get to, to advocate for our career field, I think the, uh, the better off we're gonna be in the long run. You know, SEER, you know, along some of the other career fields are always hurting for numbers, especially on the recruiting side. You know, so the more chances we get to, to get our name out there, to get what, what we really do and what we can offer you, you know, the better. So appreciate it again. Thanks for your time. Uh, so let's start out with, uh, with my current position. You know, because you mentioned I am here at Lackland. I'm the flight chief for SSTOC, so our initial orientation force. So if you are planning on coming into SEER, and uh, you go to basic training, you have a, a SEER shred to come in, try out the SEER specialist course, uh, you're gonna see me. I got uh, five other cadre that work down here with me, and I run the 15-day course where we assess and select our initial candidates before we send them up to Fairchild. So I'm really the, the entry point, I guess, for the first person you're gonna see along your entrance into the pipeline. Um, you know, other places that I've worked, I'll go ahead and tell you a little bit about that. You know, so I started out, you know, of course, as a SEER guy, your first base is gonna be Fairchild Air Force Base. You know, it's a 21 week tech school. So once you assess and are selected down here, you'll wind up PCSing up to Fairchild and that'll be your first duty station. Uh, if you're single, you know, you're just gonna go from here, grab your stuff and head up to, uh, to Fairchild. If not, you know, you're gonna go home, grab your wife, kids, take them with you. And then you'll start your pipeline process once you get to Fairchild. The process from start down here to finish up at Fairchild is about a year long. You know, so you're gonna be a, a student for at least that first year of, uh, of your time in the Air Force. And then once you graduate, or like you know, the, all the cadre like to say, if you graduate, uh, you'll spend the next three to four years working at Fairchild, most likely teaching the combat survival course for the Air Force. Uh, myself, you know, I graduated and I went over to Charlie Flight. You know, if we got SEER guys that are watching now, I know they're thinking, thinking Charlie Flight, Alpha Flight, Bravo Flight. You know, there's always a big competition between flights. Uh, but I did my first three years there. You know, I worked with some, some really great individuals, had some great uh, supervisors, some good mentors. Uh, some of my, uh, you know, my closest friends, classmates were in Charlie Flight with me. You know, so I had a first, first three years in the Air Force that were just you know, really outstanding. Had a good time at Fairchild, the location is great. You know, if you've never been to Washington State or that part of the country in general, uh, if you're an outdoor enthusiast, you know, it's a, it's a great place to be. Uh, so I did my three years working the flights, teaching SV-80. Uh, after that, I had my first deployment. And so I did a deployment four months, uh, went to Afghanistan, came back, and when I came back, I decided that I would like to go over and work the actual six month tech school. You know, so I uh, started talking to my supervisor, the guys over at the tech school, uh, did a short interview process, 
and then they brought me over to work at the tech school. So my first six years in the Air Force, you know, when you're thinking stability, you know, I spent the first six years at my first duty station. So six years total at Fairchild. You know, working the, the tech school portion of it, you know, it's a longer course, almost six months long. You know, so you get to spend a lot of time with uh, with the group of students. You know, really get to see them change from, you know, when they first show up and they start training to the point where they're graduating and they're getting their their instructor cookie and now they're moving over to the field flights to start teaching at uh, at SV80. Now, from there, I got a job at Cannon Air Force Base. Now, time frame wise, that's right when Cannon changed to an AFSOC base. You know, so I went down there to a, a five-man shop. You know, I got to work again with some uh, some great individuals down there, and I spent three and a half years at Cannon Air Force Base. You know, if, if you've heard of the base, you, you've probably also heard that the location isn't the greatest, and you know I can somewhat confirm that. But the the mission and the job and the people that I worked with made that a, a really good assignment for me and my family. So location aside. You know, the, the job and the mission, the people, the air crew were all outstanding. So I had a really good time there. Again, went on a lot of fun TDYs, had great support from my squadron. Um, so did another deployment there before I left. So that's that was two for me at that point. So at, you know, roughly nine years in the Air Force, I had done two deployments. Uh, assessed for another job, I uh, got hired, went down to Pope. I uh, spent five years working at Pope, uh, did another seven deployments while I was there. Um, and again, that was that was my choice. I knew that was going to happen. Uh, that was something that I wanted as far as my career goes. I liked the, the other aspect of the SEER job that you do while you deployed. You know, so that, uh, that really kind of attracted me to going to that location or applying for that location. So five great years there and then decided I wanted to come back to AETC. You know, those five years, I, I wasn't really in much of an instructor role, so I missed the uh, the kind of teaching and the, the interaction with students. Uh, so again, started making calls, found out that there was going to be a position opening up at uh, at Lackland, you know, for a flight chief position to run the schoolhouse. You know, I thought about coming here when I was a younger airman, and timing just didn't work out. Uh, worked out this time, and now I'm down here, you know, with a, another great group group of guys, small shop. And you know, just loving the instructor life. You know, being a, a straight up SEER guy again, teaching the basics of SEER, and you know, again, seeing young guys learn, progress, and then you know, move on to, to other things in the career. Awesome. Good so far. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that was great. So, <clears throat> prior to you coming to the Air Force, what's your background? What sports did you play? Where did you grow up? Those types of things. Uh, background. So I guess being back in Texas is nice. Uh, I'm originally from Texas. I'm from the Panhandle, so up north, where it's uh, it's really flat. Wind blows a lot. <laughs> Not many trees. So uh, you know, being down here in San Antonio, it's definitely a different climate. A little bit hotter, more humid, but we don't have that 40 mile an hour breeze that we have uh, up in North Texas. Uh, as far as background goes, you know, Sierra does spend a lot of time outdoors. I guess we're kind of you know known as being, I guess. I say mountain men, so we do spend a lot of time up in the woods, uh, hiking around. A lot of us hunt, a lot of us fish. Uh, I didn't necessarily do a lot of that when I was growing up, though. Uh, I played sports. You know, I did soccer, basketball, baseball, football. You know, while I was growing up, so I, I spent a lot of my time doing that. You know, fishing trips, camping a little bit with the family, but not really like an avid outdoorsman. Uh, I liked ham camping. I liked hiking. It just wasn't something that you know when I. When I grew up, I didn't really just didn't do it, you know. So, seeing the career field and I guess kind of finding out what SEER was in basic training because I didn't know prior to coming into basic. I came in uh, with a guaranteed weather job. When I went to my recruiter, uh, for whatever reason during that time they weren't recruiting for SEER, so he mentioned it, but he just mentioned it. And I didn't really learn anything about it. So I got to that second week of basic training, and that's when they were actively recruiting at basic for. Uh, your Battlefield Airman career fields um, and SEER as well. I saw the SEER brief. I said, if you're interested, come back. I think it was like two days later, came back, uh, sat through a 30 minute brief, did 10 push ups that took like 20 minutes, you know, really thinned out the crowd that thought they were, that they were interested. Uh, you know, signed the contract, I think, the day later and, you know, started prepping during basic training to, to come over to the schoolhouse. 
you know, so I really didn't know a lot up front. So I think you now nowadays with the with our with our webpage, you know, GoSeer.com, uh, all the stuff that recruiting is doing for us now, I think I think candidates have a lot a lot more to to watch and to learn from before they ever ever show up at basic to really prep them for the course because I I didn't have that. I wish I would have. Um, yeah, but I I managed to, to squeeze my way through, you know, one way or the other. So as far as you know, backgrounds that we see in students. Uh, you know, they come from all walks of life. You know, there's not a, a whole lot, let's say, of, of, I guess, that mountain men mentality anymore. You know, a lot of kids come from inner city or, you know, not necessarily the rural areas, rural areas like the, you know, like they had maybe 20 years ago that were attracted to this type of career field. Um, you know, so you don't, you don't have to come from that background to be successful. If, uh, if you're interested in SEER, if being an instructor, if working in the outdoors appeals to you, you don't have to have that background. We're going to teach you everything that you need to know. Uh, you know, we start off with the basics and we build on that. You know, and before you know our one month you know pipeline is over, you'll be proficient. You know, in all those skills. So don't think that you know because you grew up in the city or you don't have a background in hunting or fishing that you know that you're not going to do good at the tech school. Because that's that's definitely not the case. Perfect. So, what, so what's the actual training pipeline like? I mean, how many days, the location? I know you kind of got into it a little bit during your intro, but where exactly are they going to spend their time? How many days are they going to be there? So if you're if you're coming straight out of basic training, you'll graduate basic, you'll come over here, you'll check in with our MTLs, you go through what's called a, a zero week. So you do your own processing, you just kind of get settled in over at the dorms, and then you'll see us that coming Monday. So you show up Monday morning, uh, and that starts your 15-day assessment and selection process that you're going to have at this schoolhouse. So this is SV70A. That's the, the course name for what we do here. So you'll spend 15 days with us. Uh, the first two weeks are, are all on-base activities. Uh, so you'll have PT every morning. You'll have uh, another pass test assessment the very first day. Uh, you do the ruck assessment. So you'll do the four-mile ruck, 60 to 65 pounds in under one hour. Uh, then you'll again said so you'll have PT every day, and then you'll have a, a SEER PT test on the very last day of training on base. Uh, so that takes you more or less through your time on base. Um, you go back to your dorms for the weekend. You kind of get to eat, rest, recuperate from the two weeks of training on base. And then that following Monday morning, we take you to the field, and that's where we teach you kind of the basics of SEER. So you learn the basics of fire, shelter. Uh, some navigation training, you know, we get some rookie in out there and on that last day out there you have a, a short assessment of the skills that we taught you and then we come back Friday. So it's, it's really only four days that last Friday morning we just kind of pack up and come home. But, um, you know, it's Texas, you know, so when you're thinking about the climate here, you know, during the summertime it's, it's plenty hot, you know, so it's a, an uncomfortable environment for, for most folks when they go out there, especially if you're not used to being outdoors. And then just the time of year, you know, being 95, 98 degrees, you know, it's uh, it's it's rough. I'm not gonna lie about that. The the climate and the terrain, the heat, you know, it's, it puts a lot on the students. After here, you know, you finish 15 days, you get selected. Uh, you'll again work with the MTLs. They'll go through the process of you know finalizing your orders, um, going through the checklist, TMO, you know, all that stuff you have to do in the Air Force, the PCS. Uh, then you'll go up to Fairchild. Uh, there's only two classes a year that run fair show. So if you if you finish down here, you'll be on a cycle that goes up, and then you have to uh, complete five prerequisite courses before you can start uh, either a January start date or a July start date for the five and a half month tech school at fair show. So you'll go through, let's see, I think it's uh, all the course numbers, but you'll go through the combat survival course. You'll go through uh, two water survival courses, uh, the dunker course. And then you'll go through uh, what's called the pre-team. So they go through about a 10-day course where they kind of prep you and again kind of assess you before you start your five and a half month tech school. So that that puts you right at almost six months already. And now you're going to start the five and a half month school. Awesome. Well, this is one of our questions right here from Warwolf. What are some of the common trends that you see for applicants that are failing out of the pipeline, the training pipeline? Uh, we do have failures. Um, a majority of our attrition comes from students just quitting, though. 
know, so we, we do have we have some folks that, that don't meet the uh, the physical requirements. So we, we lose a couple during the pass test. So the way it's set up now, you will do a pass test with an assessor before you ever show up to BMT. They'll watch you do a pass test. They'll certify that you passed all the requirements, so you were able to do the swim, push ups, pull ups, sit ups, and the run, and you met all the times or the number of reps. Um, you'll show up to basic. You have to go through basic. You know, we, we hear a lot of complaints that uh, you know candidates don't get to work out enough during basic, which which I can see. They have a pretty busy schedule, and they can only do so much with an entire you know flight of trainees to keep everybody in shape. So sometimes they lose a little bit, so they'll show up and, and redo that pass test, and you know for whatever reason, you know maybe they aren't able to do enough sit ups or they can't do enough pull ups. Um, so they they will either get recycled if they were, were within a percentile of making the minimum number, or if they were way off, then they'll have to get uh, reclassed, and the Air Force will find them another job. What's so uh, the maybe the one or two pieces of advice you can give for a candidate? before coming in to prepare themselves for the training pipeline? I would definitely say preparation is key. Uh, we have multiple workouts on our website that will help get you into the shape that you need to be in. Uh, past, past standards are out there, you know, look them up. Make sure that you can far exceed those, realizing that those minimum numbers are the very low end of the scale of what you need to come into the career field. You know, so if you only need 48 push-ups, then you need to try and do at least 60. That way you've got some, some wiggle room if something happens on that test day and you can't knock out you know, that 60, well maybe you can only do 54, but you're still beating the, at least the minimum amount as far as the standards go. Um, you know, so definitely get on a good workout routine. Um, ruck if you, if you can. So if, you, if you've never carried a ruck, I mean it doesn't seem like it's a hard thing to do, but to put on 60 to 65 pounds, especially for some of our smaller individuals, and then ruck four miles when you've never done it before, you know, it's, it's kind of a daunting or challenging thing. And I think it's almost as much mental as it is physical sometimes. So if you get that practice and you know, based on your prior routine, your prior workouts, that you can carry a 50 pound pack or 60 pound pack because you've done it during your practice workouts, then you're gonna be more successful when you show up at the schoolhouse. Um, so yeah, get a good backpack, build up slowly, you know, start with 25 pounds, and then, you know, every week, every two weeks, add another five to 10 pounds until you can get up to that 60 to 65 pound range, and you can keep up that 15 per minute mile pace. All right, so that's, that's what it takes to, to finish in that 60 minute time frame. And normally our students finish in around 55 minutes. Awesome. Uh, diet, it's probably another big one. And yeah, so if you, uh, if you're not eating healthy, and I'm not saying you need to be, you know, like 1% body fat when you show up to the course, that's probably the, the wrong answer. Having, having a little bit of fat store on you is definitely not going to hurt. Uh, but eat healthy. Um, you're going to be getting your three three meals a day basic training. You're going to be getting three meals a day over here at the Chow Hall. The Chow Hall has plenty of healthy food. Uh, and try and get yourself off of all the unhealthy stuff. So, you know, stay away from the monsters, Red Bulls, you know, stuff that's going to, you know, screw up. You know your body and your system. Uh, protein's fine, um, but don't don't overdo it. You know, protein powder, uh, things like that. You know are allowed over here, but the medics do really watch what students are, are putting in their body just to make sure that you know during our PT sessions, and you know you couple that with a little bit of you know lack of sleep, you know that they're that they're still going to be good to go for training the next day, and they're not damaging themselves. Well, even going through the, your training, uh, becoming a SEER specialist, and throughout your career, what has been your greatest challenge? Oh, man. Uh, I would say during training, you, know, you, you have multiple phases when you get up to the tech school that you go through. Um, I was a smaller individual. You know, I'm, I'm definitely not big now. But you know, when I came into the military, I, I think I was 140 pounds. You know, so I wasn't throwing around a whole lot of weight you know, when, I, when I was up at Fairchild. So the ruck, um, you do a phase at Fairchild that's mobile, you carry your you know 70-ish pound pack, and you wake up in the morning, you put your pack on, and you practice navigation techniques, and you do that all day. You know, at some point you'll stop and make a fire, at some point you're gonna stop and make uh, your shelter for the night, and then you're gonna wake up, rinse and repeat, and you're gonna do that seven more days. So as a, as a smaller individual, and then again, not knowing I was gonna be a seer specialist, 
you know, I'd never ever practiced rucking before, and I was a winter class, hard class. Uh, so I'd never worn snowshoes either. So now I'm I'm in the mountains at Fairchild. It's cold out. And there's like five feet of snow, and now I've got on these big magnesium snowshoes that are like two and a half feet long. Yeah, but they're not the, like the nice short MSR ones. At least you know, older guy we didn't have those. I think they got the newer ones now, but. Yeah, so here I am tromping through the woods, and the first day I think I spent as much time picking myself up as I did actually walking. Just wasn't just wasn't used to it. You know, so that was probably my hardest like physical challenge, and that was just as much mental too. So you know, talking to guys about my mental fortitude and you know finding something to grab onto to get you through training. You now for me it was family and, and faith. So whenever I was having a hard time, um, you know I just, I just thought about family and, and, and God. So, and that, that got me through it. You know, I wanted my wife to be proud of me. I wanted to be able to look at my kids, uh, you know, when they got older and, and tell them that I didn't quit. And that, that worked for me. Very nice. What's been your most memorable moment? Oh man, I've- Sounds like you I've, had a lot of them. So. I don't know if I've been fortunate. I would say I have, but I, I've been and done, been to and done some really cool stuff in my, in my career. Uh, God, at Fairchild, you know, even before before I PCS anywhere, I had a lot of awesome TDYs. Uh, I got the chance to go on a, a 36 day Alpine mountaineering and leadership course. So the military paid for a TDY, which it, it wasn't that expensive when you when you look at the total price, but uh, a 36 day course through uh, AAI over in uh, Bellingham, Washington, to excuse me, you know, teach us. Alpine mountaineering skills, so uh, glacier travel, ice climbing, uh, basic rock climbing, and then as, as we progressed, you know, we went, got into uh, building anchors, climbing with gear, you know, to the point where we got on our, our last iteration and we more or less planned our whole trip, we decided where we wanted to go, so we decided we wanted to go to the Bugaboos in British Columbia. So, and if you've never seen pictures of it, you know, just, just Google Bugaboos British Columbia, and it's gonna pull up, you know, 1500 to 2000 foot just rock spires that are sticking out of the snow and the glaciers and it's it's awesome to look at and then you know we went and climbed it you know and coming from up in you know north texas where it's flat you know never would have guessed in my life that i would have been doing something like that um other city wise i've, uh, I've been to columbia i've been to peru uh, i found myself you know sitting on the beach in, in israel for a couple weeks uh, you know so the, i've got a long list of like really fun cool stuff that I've done you know all on the uh, you know in the sake of training and, and doing you know seer mission so. what's the what's the coolest thing you've done you said man this is this is pretty sweet I can't believe I get paid for this I'm a bit of an adrenaline junkie so I I gotta say the jumping out of airplanes you know I uh, I did some fun stuff growing up uh, getting into the military and that kind of transitioning into filling filling that that need that gap I guess you know and jumping out of airplanes was was perfect basic airborne uh, you know it, it was okay not, not a whole lot of fun about smacking the ground on a uh, on a static line shoot but uh, going to free fall school uh, you know doing doing oxygen jumps getting out at 18,000 25,000 feet that's that's a pretty cool feeling you know falling falling for that amount of time and you know you're watching you know 15 20 guys go out in front of you you know we did a couple of them at night so you know you're doing it it's dark and you can see like lights of the city you know off in the distance uh that, that's definitely at the top of the list how'd you get picked up to go to free fall school uh, i want i want to say, say luck again i was in the right place at the right time uh i met all the qualifications uh so one of our uh one of our i guess senior instructors he had uh had been supporting one of the free fall schools for a while. Finally got the opportunity to bring the student with him. You know, so I'd, uh, I'd already been a static line jump master. Uh, so I was I was an active jumper and that, that definitely helped. I was involved with the program uh, and then just kept on, not necessarily nagging, but had everything ready. So when it came time to, hey, who are the, who, who can go show me the list? You know, I, I was on there. And I, again, I think just just by luck, some other people weren't available to go, and all of my paperwork and stuff was in order. So, you know, I got the chance to go to free fall school, and it's it's been fun. It's pretty lucky right there. So, speaking of free fall school, what's been the scariest moment that you've had out in the field? In the field or during a jump? 
In the field. In the field. Um, scariest moment for one of my students, which, you know, as an instructor, you know, you take a, a level of responsibility for what happens to your students. Uh, winter trip, again, you know, just for them, just like for me, you know, a lot of them hadn't been on snowshoes before. Uh, walking through the woods, you know, there's fallen trees everywhere. You, you trip and fall quite a bit. Uh, one of our students got his snowshoe hung on a tree or somehow he tripped, but he, he fell and he fell downhill and the back of his pack hit him in the back of the head. So he, he went unconscious for just a, a short second, but he you know, was complaining about his head and his neck hurting, which, you know, he just fell on his pack, landed on it, so it kind of makes sense. You know, but we were worried that more more was wrong with him than, than what we could kind of tell. So, you know, we got on the radio, we called our IDMTs, uh, we have a Huey squadron that supports us up there. So we gave them coordinates. Uh, they flew in, they put the IDMT down through the trees on hoist. Uh, he walked over with the backboard. Uh, we helped him package up the student and then we moved him 20 or 30 yards to an area where it was more open so they could hoist him out. And, you know, he hooked up, rode up with the student and then they flew the student um, back to back to the hospital to get an exam and check his neck out. I say scary for me because it wasn't me that was hurt, but at the same time, I was like, man, that was that was my guy. I hope he's okay. You know, didn't hurt his neck or his head. You know, nothing that's gonna you know, damage his career just from taking a fall. So, All right. Well, speaking of students, what type of people can actually go through Sear School? So, people that go through Sear School are going to be air crew. So, if you're flying an aircraft or if your job is going to be to work on an aircraft like a loadmaster, you're going to go through Sear School. Um, if you're Battlefield Airmen, you're going to go through Sears School. Uh, we do have people from other services that come over and go through as well. So you might see some, uh, some Army or Marines or Navy folks going. Not a lot, but you know, onesie twosies, they'll be going through the course too. Um, essentially, anybody that's considered high risk. You know, so if there's the possibility that you're going to be in a position to be isolated, you know, possibly behind enemy lines, like flying an aircraft and, and having some type of emergency or getting shot down, you know, those are the folks that are going to, going to come through the course. <clears throat> Prior to actually being selected as a SEER specialist and, and going through basic training, how good do you have to be at swimming before joining? Oh, buddy, I was I was not a swimmer. Yeah, you know, my uh, got probably the longest I had swam before coming into the military was from the diving board to the edge of the pool. Uh, it's only two hundred meters though. You know, two hundred meters is not that far. Uh, the time the time is 10 minutes so it's not like you have to be fast you just have to keep forward movement and use one of three designated strokes so you you don't have to be like a like a high school swimmer or a you know somebody that trained you know as, as a to swim for time or anything like that it's you have to be able to stay above water keep moving forward not stop not touch the ground and do it in under 10 minutes Bad. So we got this question a lot. Uh, I know you kind of touched on it, especially with all the deployments that you've been on. So what does a SEER specialist do while deployed? What's their, their overall mission? A lot of that depends on who you're deploying for, kind of like what your tasking is. Um, big thing is it's, it's different than what you do stateside. So stateside, you, you have your normal job of being a SEER specialist where you're either teaching at a SEER school or you know, majority of the SEER specialists that aren't at Fairchild are at bases that have like a flying unit. So they're doing continuation SEER training. Um, when you deploy though, you know, you might be doing a little bit of training, you know, depending on what, like I said, what deployment you have, what tasking you have. So you might be, you know, going out to other bases and giving like refresher training on survival radios or survival equipment. Um, other side of that is you might be working in like a planning cell you know, so you're working with maybe a unit that you deployed with and you're helping them with their uh, their PR plan, their EPAs, their ISO preps, um, making sure that, you know, all those things are updated, that they're filling them out every time that they go fly. So you're, you're the, their own, more or less, PR SME, you know, while they're, while they're in country. Uh, there's onesie twosies here guys that do, uh, you know, some, some slightly different stuff while they're deployed, but most of the SEER deployments kind of fall in that bucket. So. When you're not out uh, with the unit, you know, helping them with their plans, you might be sitting in uh, like an operations center or a jock, you know, one of those big rooms where you've got, you know, the 50 TVs lining the walls and you're, you're watching feed from UAVs and from aircraft, you know, and kind of watching the battle space. 
um, while your guys are out there you know, doing the mission of flying. So if somebody gets captured, does, does the entire room look to you as, as the specialist to say, where is this guy and how do we get him out? They're going to look to you for a couple of different things. So um, one is, you know, that planning that you had done with the crews prior to them taking off. So, you know, they're going to want their EPAs. They're going to want, uh, you know, all the ISO preps that were involved with that crew. Um, they're going to want a list of what equipment they had on them. All that stuff's going to be listed out on their EPA anyway. Um, but the whole jock is going to come alive if something like that happens. Not only the jock, but if, if an aircraft goes down and any uh, AO, say, say Afghanistan or, or Iraq, that, that whole floor is going to be dedicated to, to getting those people back. And you're going to be an integral piece in that, but you're not going to be the only piece. Um, but you will have a, a big say kind of in, in some of the questions that are being asked. So, yeah, I mean, you, you will be working diligently and, and vigorously until all those people are, are found and returned. And then even then, once they're returned, you're, you're still going to have a part in that as well. Very nice. We got some, it looks like we have some individuals that are that are probably on active duty, or maybe they're in the Guard and the Reserves, or maybe in another branch of service. So what tips uh, do you have for retraining applicants uh, that are trying to go through the pipeline? Uh, for retraining, again, the, we only have so many slots per year. You know, so most, you know, I'd say like 95% of our seats are for people coming straight out of basic training. Uh, so depending on the needs of the Air Force and the needs of our career field, we might only be accepting, say, E3s or E4s and below for cross-training. So if you're an E6 or an E7, you, you might not have the opportunity based on your rank. You know, right now, as far as like techs and masters go, I think the career field is like over 100%. You know, if we were at 50%, then we would open that window up and we would be, you know, and opening the aperture to get some higher rank individuals to come in, but that's just not the case right now. So senior airman is, is the cap right now for people to cross train and to come in at that rank. What are some things that you're looking in in a prior prior service candidate as far as you know mental alertness, physicality, those types of things, some traits that you're looking for? Uh, so if we have 20 packages to look at, you know, we're, we're gonna look at all those packages and, and see, you know, based on what we know about, about our candidates and success, success rates, you know, who's, who's gonna have the best shot. So, you know, any, any derogatory stuff is is probably gonna, you know, push your package to the side. Um, not to say that you, you won't be looked at fairly, but, you know, you're looking at 20 people who really wanna be here, they're gonna look at disqualifying factors and that's probably gonna be one of them. Um, you know, but if you're a hard charger, if you've got lots of awards, uh, if you've got like a good recommendation, a uh, letter from your commander, from your supervisor, all those things are going to help with your package to get noticed over others. Is it hard to advance in rank as a seer specialist? Or a smaller career field. So I wouldn't necessarily say that it's harder, but it's, it's something that, that you have to be focused on. You know, anybody that wants to make rank is going to do what they need to you know, to get the awards, to get the quarterlies, and now that we have the new FD system, you know, it, it adds a new factor to it. So I wouldn't say it's harder, but I think there, there's more factors to consider now than there were you know, three years ago before they changed the, the testing system. So you're married, right? Yes. Okay, how's married life as, as a SEER specialist? Uh, well, family life in general, you know, if you're, if you're worried about being gone a lot or not really having a consistent schedule, family life has been really good. I said uh, I was married before I came into the military, so um, before I left here, you know, I coordinated with my wife, coordinated with all the, the agencies on base, Excuse me. went home, um, packed up all my stuff after I graduated the 15-day course here, me and my wife drove to Spokane. Uh, we checked in there, went into TLF, and we got a house on base. So if you're, if you're married, you're going to have the opportunity to live on base or to get a house off base. If you're not married, you're going to go over to the survival dorms and you'll live in the dorms. Uh, but I was able to go home every night, at least the nights that, that we were on base, not in the field training. Um, and then after graduating the course, you, know, you have a, at the time, it was a three week rotation as far as the schedule of going to the woods. Now it's a four week rotation. So you'll do one week in the woods, three weeks on base. And that's your, that's your normal like daily ops schedule. You know, there might be a, a TDY that comes up or something that gets thrown in there to where you're you're gone for you know three weeks out of the out of the month, but 
the norm for those first three years is going to be one week in the field, three weeks on base. And then after that, it, it totally depends on where you go. Um, good thing, again, about being a, a small career field is, you know, you're able to reach out, talk to your functionals, talk to some of the chiefs, um, find out, you know, what bases are coming open around the, the time frame that you're looking to PCS. So I'd, I'd like to say you have a little bit, little bit more control over your future as far as where you want to go, um, as opposed to, you know, really large career fields to where, you know, there, there's so many options and so many variables you can't kind of predict. Um, but I've always been fortunate that I, I had a list of places that I wanted to go and I was able to, wouldn't, wouldn't necessarily pick and choose, but every place I've gone, I wanted to go there. I haven't been involved anywhere. I haven't got shipped anywhere that I, that I didn't want to be. And I think that's, that's been fortunate. Yeah, very fortunate, yeah. Uh, you've already kind of talked about military free fall training. I know there's been a lot of questions on that. Um, let's see here. What do you think the most challenging aspect is for your students going through SEER training? Not the trainees, the actual students. So not, not the SEER candidates, the actual right. students for? Right. Air, crew, Air crew, Battlefield Airmen. I don't know, the fear of the unknown maybe. You know, a lot of them hear about, uh, about being in the woods who have never spent any time like outdoors away from you know, four concrete walls and, uh, you know, a roof over their heads. So a lot of them uh, aren't comfortable with being outside, especially, you know, in the woods in the middle of winter, you know, sleeping almost on the ground, you know, in a, in a shelter that they built. So a little bit of a, a shock for them. Uh, RT portion, you know, people get really apprehensive about that. What's the RT portion? Uh, resistance training, but part of the pipeline, but don't worry about it. The funniest thing you've seen as a SEER instructor, <laughs> or SEER specialist, sorry. Uh, for SV80, I, I think it just has to be walking around in snowshoes in the winter. Um, up at Fairchild, there's there's things called a tree well. So you've got all these uh, you know, pine trees where snow falls and it, it creates more or less a hole under the, the base of the tree. And you know, students not being familiar with it or being uh, you know, good on snowshoes, they'll get too close to that edge and you'll be walking and one second you've got six students and the next second you got five and you're looking around and you see these snowshoes kind of sticking up in the snow but you can't see the rest of the person because they've, you know, fallen down on the base of the tree and they got to pack on they, you know, kind of help me, I, I can't get up type scenario. Uh, for, for candidates, like working at the tech school, uh, just the stuff that they have to eat. You know, we've all done it as far as, you know, being, being the seer student that had to eat the nasty stuff but you know if you if you don't know what a banana slug is you know google banana slug and then just just imagine eating you know a three or four inch banana slug and just the the oozing nastiness that that comes from putting one of those in your mouth uh but the faces and the you know the gagging from that is on the instructor side because we were there once too we had to do it but you know as cadre watching students so it's way funny so you, you guys got an alligator down the down the hall. Candidates get to experience him at all, or uh, not really. I mean, they get to feed every once in a while, but for the most part, to keep everybody's fingers, we uh, we keep Thor in the cage. Gotcha. <laughs> okay. Anything else that a candidate might be able to experience or have a general understanding, knowledgement of uh, of what they might be able to do before coming in, uh, in as a seer specialist, besides eating banana slugs. Yeah, don't go out and force yourself to eat nasty stuff because that, that'll happen during training for you. Uh, yeah, be in good physical shape. Um, if you have the ability to get outside and spend some time outdoors, do it. Um, you know, meet up with uh, maybe some individuals that have spent some time outdoors, can teach you a little bit of navigation training. And not, not to say, again, you don't have to have this beforehand, but it, you know, if you want to be more comfortable with those skills because you've practiced them beforehand, you know, then, then by all means, you know, go for it. You know, get you a good backpack. You know, find a place to go hiking, spend some time out on the trail, uh, spend some time outdoors, you know, get yourself kind of acclimated, I guess. Uh, and then just just be prepared for, you know, any, any different type of scenario that can happen during training. So you, you can't control everything. So you can only be so prepared. So what does your career look like after this assignment? I know you probably have the another 10 years left in the Air Force or so. What what are the what are the kind of jobs can a seer specialist like you anticipate to take on? Uh, 
me personally, I'd like to go overseas. You know, so if you're looking at places where a SEER specialist can go, if there's an active flying unit, you can go to that base. Um, they might have limitations based on rank. So, you know, I, I might not be able to go to base X because there's only a tech sergeant below there. Um, but I, I would I'd like to go overseas. So if I could get stationed in uh, Germany or the UK, uh, we have, you know, multiple positions over there. We've got places, uh, places you can go, uh, Japan as well. You know, so there's, there's really good locations as far as spending three or four years with your family overseas, if that's something you want to experience. Uh, a good friend of mine was in Italy, uh, and, you know, they love it. Every time they send pictures that they're, you know, they're out doing stuff, you know, they're at some orchard or in the mountains, you know, somewhere in Europe. So it seems like a really good experience, but there's only so many, so many of those available. Um, and as of yet, I, I haven't timed it right to be able to, to hit one of those spots, but... If I could do one of those before I before I retire, I'd, I'd like to spend some time overseas. Sweet, me and you both, Italy, It'd be great. All right, so after life as a SEER specialist, upon retirement or, or separation, whichever one individuals decide to do, everybody's life is different. What could a SEER specialist do on the outside with their training? Well, things that you can do to help prep for that: go to college. You know, especially those first three to four years while you're a fair child and you've got a fairly decent schedule go to school um, if you already have you know some semester hours one or two years of college before coming in that's perfect because now you've only got maybe one or two years of going to classes at night or doing online courses before you've got your bachelor's degree you know, so again prep before you get out and you know maybe you know, maybe you decide to do something else after six to ten years of being a seer guy and now you've got that bachelor's degree maybe now you want a commission uh, you know, we've had a lot of seer guys in the last three or four years do that you know so they work on their bachelor's degree um, when you graduate from the tech school, you almost have enough credits to get your CCAF. So that first six months after that, you know, study for some CLEPS, maybe take one or two classes at the community college, and you can have your associate's degree from the community college of the Air Force, you know, within, you know, 18 months of being in the military. You know, so you can prep, you can have that bachelor's degree. Uh, there's multiple guys I know that are working on their master's already. You know, still enlisted guys, you know, E7s, E8s, just working on that education. Um, you get a lot of experience as far as being an instructor. So when you think about like course management, curriculum management, um, maybe actually um, being a teacher, you know, when you get out, you know, those are all options. Um, there's a lot of contractors, civilian jobs uh, in the SEER realm, you know, that you can do as well. You know, we've got 18, 20 contractors that work across the street at our ECAT course, and there's a lot of uh, retired SEER guys and SEER guys that got out like six, six to eight years that work over there. I bet. How much does it cost to get your associate's degree in the Air Force? It's free. There you go. Sorry, we just had to put a recruiting plug in there, so <laughs> not bad. No, take advantage of, advantage of that tuition assistance because they're going to pay for it for you. All right. So have you, we got one guy asked a question, have you had any run-ins with animals while out in the field? And if so, what have been some of the most interesting ones? Oh, man. Uh, I've seen you know, probably four, four or five moose up in Washington that you know I was maybe a little, a little closer than I wanted to be. You know, walking through the woods, you know, with students, you know, especially during like the invasion portion of it, where you're trying to not make as much noise. You know, you'll, you'll pop out of the trees every once in a while and be a lot closer to, to animal life than you would think. Uh, I've seen a couple of bears, a couple of, uh, a couple of mountain lions. Not, not from up close, not near as close as, as, as the moose that I've seen up there. Uh, had, a, had a run in with a, a donkey while I was in Israel. Uh, thank you to uh, retired Chief Barnes, who, uh, who dared, dared me to, uh, to ride the, the Bedouin, Bedouin's donkey. Uh, yeah, I rode, rode bulls in, in like Bronx in high school, but had never been as scared then as I was when I had to get on this this donkey that did not like the way that you know the Americans smelled compared to <laughs> the guy that owned him. But uh, yeah, that's, that's probably it. Nice, nice. So somebody's saying that Bigfoot exists, and you're probably going to find them if you're out there. So <laughs> there there have been plenty of Bigfoot sightings during SBA, guaranteed. All right. Oh, uh, one question. You brought it up without going into too much detail. Uh, what's the ECAC? On, on a cross. Well, number one, what does it stand for? And just, again, without going into too much detail, what, what is it? So, Evasion and Conduct After Capture, uh, it's, a, it's a shortened version for people who need 
uh, that resistance training side, but they don't need the entire SB80 course, which is what we have at Fairchild. So it's a condensed version where they still get some of the skills that they might need if they're gonna be in harm's way in a deployed location without getting that full 21 day course at Fairchild. Fair so. Easy enough right there. Okay, and that's here at Lackland, right? Yes. All right, sir. cool. All right, um, seeing a couple comments on here. So, does Sear ever, does Sear Specialists ever get to train with PJs, combat controllers, or ever work with PJs, combat controllers, tech bees? You do. So, uh, as a support troop, you know, combat support troop, you know, there's multiple locations to where you might be assigned to like a rescue squadron. So, you, you might be working with those PJs daily. Uh, you might deploy with them as well. I know a lot of guys that are at RQSs. Um, they'll do those 60, 90 day rotations with their with their squadrons. So, you know, they're going and deploying to, to locations with the same PJs that they support on a daily basis back home. Uh, special tactics squadrons, there's not as many uh, positions open yet, but we're getting there. Uh, so we started putting SEER positions in special tactics squadrons uh, about five to six years ago. And, you know, some of the older guys might correct me on that, but, um, so you're gonna be working with your combat controllers there as well. Uh, you know, I guess in the near future, if uh, if it happens, you know, RQSs or PJs in general, I think all that rescue might be moving to AFSOC. You know, so they'll all be under uh, one command because most of your RQSs are ACC. You know, so there are two different commands. So you got your CCTs and, and AFSOC, and your RQSs. You know, working for ACC. If you move all those to AFSOC, combine maybe combine those into some larger groups, then you definitely be be working for. PJs and controllers at the same location. Most of your special tactics squadrons are all controllers with maybe one or two PJs, but that's not all of them. But. Very nice. Now we, we got one, and we put it up on our Instagram page probably about a month ago, some SEER specialists training with NASA. Do SEER instructors also train with other agents, uh, agents from intelligence agencies? So there, there are a small number of SEER specialists that work at other agencies outside the Air Force. So the answer, the answer is yes. You know, we've, uh, we've worked with NASA multiple times. As it was actually funny, because I was, I was in Galveston um, months before um, the current set of, of astronauts were up the, the SEER school, and we were doing a tour in the bay, and they actually had the space capsule down there with the Coast Guard that they were running the initial tests on for those specific group of astronauts that they were gonna train with. So it was, it was just by chance that I, I saw that while I was on vacation. And then SEER guys actually went down and supported with that same capsule uh, with the group of astronauts that they trained in the pool. Very nice. It's pretty interesting. We'll probably do one or two more questions. I, I know Instagram's getting ready to cut us off. Uh, uh, so if a SEER specialist is assigned to a flying unit, what are their day-to-day -day operations? What can they expect to do if they're attached to a flying unit? Also for refresher training, now you've got to do Conduct after capture refresher training. You have to do your uh, kind of like your wood skills refresher. Um, then you have EPT, so emergency parachute training. Um, if you're at a unit where you've got uh, maybe CB22s or a helo unit, you'll do heats training as well. So you'll have blocks or weeks set up to where you, know, you have air crew come into your classroom and Monday through Friday you run like a refresher training week. So um, you know on Monday and Tuesday. You, know, you might be doing uh, PowerPoint lessons and some hands-on stuff, uh, like basic survival, uh, refreshing nav, uh, in preparation for maybe spending one to two days with your air crew out on the range and actually physically going through all those motions as well. Interesting, okay. All right, well, this last question right here. Uh, what are the attrition rates through the SEER pipeline, just on average? On average, down here, 60 to 70%. And then up at the schoolhouse, around 50. Okay. Yeah, so. Well, you brought up special tactics units, so I guess we'll do one more. So, is there certain qualifications individuals have to, SEER specialists have to meet in order to be selected for a special tactics squad or to work with AFSOC? For, for some of them, there's a very specific process. Um, you got to think we're, we're putting SEER guys into positions where in some cases there hasn't been a SEER guy before. So, you know, the, the functionals, uh, the chiefs are, are gonna try and pick an individual who's gonna be successful there. You know, somebody, especially if they're standing up a, a program, you know, they're gonna pick a very capable individual. So I would say yes, I mean, there might not be, uh, you know, like a green door process, 
so long interview process, but you know, they, they're definitely going to look and make sure that they're picking the right people to, to fill those positions, especially, you know, when they're brand new. Very nice. Well, cool. Well, uh, we're going to go ahead and wrap it up. I'll go ahead and join it. So, uh, <coughs> all right. Again, thanks to everybody for coming out. Um, what we're going to go ahead and do is we're going to go ahead and post this video up uh, on our YouTube page. So if you want to head on over to YouTube, probably within the next day or so, uh, we're going to have that YouTube page is USAF Special Operations Recruiting. Uh, so we'll have Sergeant Mooney's video up there. As we continue to do these, we're going to continue to promote them either on, you, on our Instagram page or on our Facebook page. We'll be sure, if you cannot catch them, we'll be sure to save them and post them up there. So uh, I'd like you to go ahead and close it out. I appreciate what you've done. appreciate your time. So go ahead and final remarks. All yours. Yeah, again, so, yeah, thanks for the opportunity. Hopefully this, uh, this video reaches you know, the right people. Uh, just remember, you know, the GoSeer.com webpage, there's numbers on there. If you want to call this office, we have a uh, Shmi here who will be able to answer all your questions. You know, so definitely call us. Um, yeah, I've got, got to put one little line out. Uh, you dunked it, Mooney. So those those who know that will, will know where that came from. Uh, but thanks for your time. Looking forward to your phone call. Maybe I'll see you down here. <laughs>